Hey guys, and welcome back to San Cabrillo Zoo, where today we are building for the lovely little African crested porcupine, and even doing a small little side aviary for kookaburras. Without further ado, welcome everyone to San Cabrillo Zoo. All right, everyone, here we are. We are finally back doing a speed build. I apologize that it's been a little bit too long. Um, I really haven't been feeling the building mood for this, and San Cabrillo Zoo is definitely a zoo where it's like, it's not like I build to build. It's I build when I'm feeling inspired. It's very much like, um, like Zeus Sarasota in that regard, but this one I actually do speed builds for. Um, so if you guys are new here, welcome. San Cabrillo Zoo is my San Diego inspired zoo. Uh, this is essentially where I'm going to be putting all my creative efforts in terms of somewhat recreating some of the themes, the ideas, the habitats from the San Diego Zoo, as well as the San Diego Safari Park, and maybe I'll even touch upon like the aquatics. Uh, but I'm not really sure on that. I'll have to see how I'm feeling by that point. Uh, so you can see I am working over here in our um, urban jungle inspired area. Now, urban jungle really isn't the prettiest area of the San Diego Zoo, but it's definitely one that has a lot of older charm. Uh, the San Diego Zoo is easily one of the more older zoos in the country. Uh, it's, well, it's technically not one of the older ones, but it has probably one of the most robust histories out of like the top dogs out of like you know your columbus your bronx zoos and stuff like that san diego zoo has really made a name for themselves in this community and you could definitely see it once you're there kind of like the evolution of the park uh be it with this area that we're kind of somewhat recreating which is of course as i just mentioned the um urban jungle area so essentially this used to be the elephant mesa and the habitat that I'm somewhat replicating right over here for the African crested porcupine, which I am kind of recreating their porcupine exhibit. This actually used to be for kangaroo, I believe, not too long ago. And even longer ago, who the hell knows what they would have thrown in here. It really wasn't top of, it was definitely top of the welfare at the time, uh, but it's still not anything that we would be doing nowadays. Uh, I feel like the little canyon, like the Bear Grottos as well, that's something you would see very much back in the day because those have been there from, like, back in the day. Uh, my parents, I was just, like, as I was kind of leaving to go to San Diego, my dad was like, hey, check out, like, these um, pictures from when your mom and I went to San Diego. And all those habitats still look pretty much the same, uh, kind of like the Bear Grottos and stuff like that, so that was kind of funny to see. Uh, so you can see over here we are working with those same tried and true kind of faux rock pillars. Uh, so I'm using the pieces from, I believe that's the Africa pack. Uh, I'm essentially using those plaster cones as a way to create this kind of faux rock look. And I'm using a whole wide variety of different other pieces to help it feel a lot more consistent within the greater area. Uh, so I'm using a whole bunch of different pieces in here, like the plaster pieces really, uh, to help everything feel very consistent with itself. Uh, this area in real life is a lot more browner than what I'm going for, but I honestly like the gray a lot more just because it helps it stick out from the rest of like the foliage, stick out from the rest of the like palettes, like the terrain palettes and stuff. I don't know. I kind of like that a lot more, but you could see this area is where it starts to get at least a little bit more green grassy, uh, in terms of the urban jungle area. So you can see that we are going to be working on a lot of greener grasses in here. We're going to be making good use of like our buffalo grasses. We're going to be making good use of uh, some of the other ones as well. Maybe the periwinkles. I'm not really sure. Uh, forgive me for like my brief kind of stunt right there. I was leaning back in my chair and it is starting to come apart. So that's a little bit of a shame. Uh, so you can see I'm combining those pillars with the faux rock pieces themselves to give it a little bit more extra texture. And I even go back later down the line to add some of the decals in there, kind of like the moss decals and stuff, just to help the wall stick out a lot more. I felt like this area was looking a little bit too sparse as well. So I decided to go in here with some of these buffalo grasses and kind of decorate it a little bit more. So essentially this is kind of like another access path for the keepers in real life. So I was like, let's see if we could kind of replicate that a little bit. So I'm using a whole wide variety of different foliage to help represent the Southern California landscape. When you're over there, 
or if you're over there, you'll notice that there's a lot of palms, there's a lot of ferns. Uh, I'm definitely trying to make good use of that over there. So I'm using a whole wide variety of different things in there, as well as bamboo. I say this in pretty much all of my projects. Bamboo is a very cheap and effective theming tool uh, when you're kind of designing your zoos, even in real life. Uh, bamboo is extremely cheap. It's very easy to grow and it looks very tropical. You could even grow it in somewhat like temperate or even taiga biomes uh, as a way to help create this effect that you're in this tropical environment. In San Diego, they really have no issue growing it whatsoever, so you're definitely going to see it as you're making your way throughout some of the sections, but they use it a lot more less, a lot less really, than what you would expect. A lot more of the times you'll see them use a lot more ferns and stuff. One of the other kind of challenges of working in this area as well is trying to decorate the rest of the area as we kind of make our porcupine habitat. So you'll see we had that little dead area right behind us currently uh, where I have a kookaburra habitat going. Uh, essentially, it's a backstage holding of the rhino habitat, but we wanted to make as much use out of this area as possible. So I figured throwing an aviary right there is something that would be extremely effective. So that's something I try and, you know, took the advantage of. Uh, I'm also doing a slightly custom door over here. Uh, in the real habitat itself, there is keeper access right there. Uh, it's access through double gates, so it's perfectly safe for uh, guests to kind of, you know, at least you won't see any guests trying to get into the porcupine exhibit is what I'm saying, really. Uh, in this habitat as well, there is a whole lot of shade for our porcupines. Most of the time when you are at a porcupine exhibit, I bet they are sleeping. Uh, porcupines sleep relatively often throughout the day, uh, and they can also burrow, which we also have in this habitat as well. But essentially, as a way to help cover all that stuff, we wanted to throw in some sunshades. Uh, so I'm using a mix of the eucalyptus tree over there on the left, and I'm also doing the London plane tree. It's not really a tree I would use all too often, but I just love the branch arrangement. And plus, we're hiding it towards the back of the habitat, so you can't really see that. I honestly think it's kind of an ugly texture, uh, but it... It's pushed towards the back, uh, so you can't really get a good glimpse of it. It looks kind of like, you know, um, organized vomit, really, to me. Uh, so adding this part over here, there is a little bit of keeper access, and I believe that's where they also have some holding as well. So I'm using the plaster technique right over here, mixed with the iron girders. Uh, these are found in the New World set. So I'm using both of these as a way to kind of create this lovely, beautiful looking uh, corrugated metal look. It's not as thin as I would want it to be. There really isn't a perfect corrugated metal piece out there right now for my purposes, uh, but I essentially kind of make do with what we have right over here. I add some other corrugated beams right there just as a way to help support this structure. It's very much kind of like something that would have been thrown together, uh, I'd say about like 20 or 30 years ago. And essentially, it wouldn't really change much after that because it's just a very simple piece. Uh, so I kind of throw a few pieces right there. And as a way to make it feel like it's a little bit more substantial, I throw in some gutters too. I'm not really sure why I put the gutters on like the side where it wouldn't drip off of. But I'll definitely add it on the other side once we actually do get into building for those animals over there. Uh, I'm essentially going to be doing kind of like a double feature episode for the next one, I think. Uh, the Fennec Fox is next on my list, and I believe I will also be doing the Cheetah and Domestic Dog Mix. So stay tuned for that one. That's going to be super fun to see. But making my way right over here as well, the inside of the habitat really wasn't as pretty as I wanted it to be. Uh, so I kind of did some custom pieces. So I kind of took like the... Um, Kind of like the tree trunks, I started to use those bark pieces alongside them, and I made this kind of like open face uh, log, and I kind of repeated that a couple of times in the habitat. Here I am putting down those decals just as a way to um, help spice up the wall a little bit more. I'm going to be doing that on the other walls throughout like the rest of the zoo as well. Luckily, we haven't really done much in this park, to be honest, uh, so it'll be relatively easy for me to do that kind of stuff. I add the rest of the pieces on here on this little den as well. I'm not sure if that affects the um, the access to that. I haven't really checked. 
Uh, again, I play in sandbox mode, guys. I apologize if you guys are looking for, like, maximum animal welfare in Planet Zoo terms. Because that's just not me. Uh, I much prefer to build much more realistic habitats. A lot more like what you would see in a real zoo rather than what matters in Planet Zoo terms. Because let's be honest, Planet Zoo terms can be a little ridiculous at times. Uh, so I essentially build what would be a realistic porcupine habitat in real life. Uh, I used a few bits of inspiration for this as well. If you guys check out my good friend Just Goron's channel, he's been doing all these really awesome real life zoo habitats for all of the arid animal pack animals and even the Planet Zoo base game ones as well. Uh, so if you guys are interested in that stuff, go check out Just Goron's channel. It's really, really helpful if you guys are looking for like a huge like a huge collection of inspiration for whatever habitat or animal you're building for just super easy to go onto his channel check out some of like you know his videos and then pop back into your game and say oh i'm gonna build this log i'm gonna build this piece of enrichment super easy to do that also decorating the staff side of this habitat as well i don't really do too many like actual keeper facility things in there because i don't know what the keeper facility things are like back there in the case if you guys have been on like a backstage tour of the san diego zoo and happen to know what would be in the backstage of a porcupine exhibit let me know because i definitely want to start doing a lot more backstage pieces in here as well and that would definitely be one that would put the icing on the cake uh, same goes for like the giraffe and the rhino ones too. Speaking of that stuff, it's very cool to see uh, how the urban jungle area is laid out because everything just feels so open concept. Like you look at the giraffe barn and it's pretty much all open to the elements. You look at that porcupine holding, again, open to the elements. Even the rhino building, while it does look like it would be an enclosed building, it is open on one side. You can look right in there and you can see the holding pens for the uh, rhinos as well it's super cool super awesome just to be able to walk through the zoo and see those tiny little details uh, so right over here I am doing the slight recreation of this kind of green wall they have this very specific color of green that's known in the community as go away green essentially if you paint something this color your eye really doesn't notice it uh, I know Disney has really perfected this if you go kind of like through the Disney parks you won't notice this green and that's the best way to notice it it's a really really simple color that helps blend in with foliage and it helps blend in with the background the environment and stuff like that really awesome stuff right there so i incorporate that right there as a way to help shield off that backstage area and beyond that i also did this custom hedge wall so i'm mixing the topiary bush alongside those latest pieces of ivy found in the twilight pack and they create this lovely dark and bright green kind of like collision that helps to really stand out i don't know how to explain it but i just love the look of it so i kind of angle those pieces on themselves as a way to help create this effect that um i don't know kind of like it's drooping over you as you're walking by it this whole area it's feeling a little bit dead right now, and I think that's because I really haven't been paying close attention to, like, all the finer details throughout here. So I've noticed these tiny little electrical boxes, at least that's what I think they are, throughout this entire kind of, like, asphalt path. Uh, the asphalt path in particular is something that, like, the tour buses will go over. I found a uh, lovely blueprint of the tour bus on the workshop. Unfortunately, I don't include it in the cinematics today, uh, but in the next episode, when we kind of do wrap up this entire section, I will be showcasing it, and I will have the name of the person who actually made it. Uh, but essentially, that's what this whole section is. It's essentially kind of like a, um, kind of like a bus route. And you can just look into each habitat super easily. It's built very much for convenience for the guest's sake. Uh, and it really can show because it's not really convenience for the animal's sake, which is interesting. Over here, I am working on the aviary I mentioned before. We did settle on building it for the kookaburra. So if you do listen very closely in the actual cinematics, I think I did include some like kookaburra calls as like an mp3 as a way for the um 
I don't know, just to build a little bit more immersion. I always do like to do that. And it's something I always neglect in my parks as well. Building audio immersion is such an incredible way to kind of help gauge your park's interest. And it's something that I noticed on my last trip to the San Diego Zoo where it's like, you have music playing, you have all these animals making sounds, all these aviaries which are filled to the brim with birds and bird calls and stuff like that. And that's an entire sense that you can't replicate well, you absolutely can replicate, but you aren't replicating in Planet Zoo. Obviously, smell, uh, you can't really do that. And honestly, I think it's probably for the best that we can't replicate the smell of zoos in Planet Zoo. But you can definitely make up for that with building up the sound library that you have. Um, I'm using the custom speakers in here as a way to help build up that kind of sound immersion. So I just went online, found like royalty-free kookaburra calls. Uh, reduce the volume on them because they are fairly loud and then I kind of just put them on a custom speaker super easy super simple as that and it's just a really awesome way to help build up that kind of engagement I think what I'm also going to try and do is kind of do like crowd sounds I feel like that would be super fun or kind of just like vague talking sounds I feel like that'd be really fun to incorporate in here uh, but you can see I'm working on this area, just trying to round out the edges. That's usually kind of how I build. Uh, if I'm building in a section, I want to make sure everything around that section, I kind of see it as like, think of line, right? And right in the middle of that line is your main focus, your habitat that you're building for. Uh, without the left and the right, there is no center point. So I build up the left a little bit and I build up the right a little bit. And it helps the habitat really sink itself into the greater sense of your zoo and really helps it stick out as the main focus. You have to build kind of like the frame around your picture and the frame has to look just as good as that picture for it to really stand out. And I think that's kind of what I'm doing over here, especially with this little aviary habitat. It's nothing too crazy. I have to give a huge shout out to my good buddy Jaguar for providing me with the kookaburra blueprint. Uh, Frontier, if you're listening, please, please um, listen to their calls on the uh, LOD issue. Uh, that's really my virtual sig virtue signaling for the day. Hope you guys enjoy the cinematics. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode and look forward to our next episode where we're going to be building for the cheetah, the fennec fox, and of course, the domestic dog. Can't wait for that one. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Be sure to stay subscribed so you don't miss the next one. Hit that little bell too. Why not? And uh, yeah, can't wait to see you all then. Bye-bye. <laughs>